Welcome to Insights and Sound, where we talk to the people behind the scenes, behind the technology, and behind the music. People you may not know, but you should. And please check out getitinwriting.net forward slash shows for a full list of our podcasts and YouTube series. My guest is Reek Havoc. I think to describe you as a sound designer is kind of doing you a disservice. It's kind of simplifying things, isn't it? A bit, yeah. I've, I have a, sort of a bifurcated uh, career uh, currently with uh, both sound design and uh, interactive exhibit design. I know that the first time I had heard of your stuff was uh, you had a company called Drastic Plastic. That's right. Which was making EPROMs. EPROMs, um, uh, drum pads. I still have one, a 30-year-old drum pad on my drum kit that's never been repaired, that still works great, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and drum triggers. Is your background more musical or technical? It started musical. Started as a drummer. I thought it was going to be a studio drummer. But I was always interested in synthesizers and electronics, uh, even to the point when I was about 19, um, my roommate and I went to a school out in the valley, and we took a class on synthesizer programming. Now, as a drummer, I had no need for a synthesizer. Didn't think that I would have one unless I had some extra money, which, of course, at the time, I didn't. And, well, um, you were a drummer. Yeah, and my exact... <laughs> So we took the class and I learned a lot about synthesis. And then electronic drums started kind of popping on the scene. In that era where drum machines became a thing, there, if you were a drummer in particular, you were either on one side or the other. You either embraced it and really learned how to program, right. or it was, it was the devil. It was the devil. Mm -hmm. So even, even before that happened, um, I got a syndrome. I stumbled into a uh, unique application with it I was hired to go to England and play with a band called Zed Benz. And uh, I brought some of my drum gear and they were renting a drum set for me. Uh, and I go to rehearsal uh, the first day and I'd met a couple of the guys in the band and they'd seen me play with my previous band. But of course I want to make a good impression. I've been learning all their songs. Uh, but they didn't have a hi-hat for me. And I said, oh, we'll, we'll get one tomorrow. I'm like, Kind of, an, Kinda, it's like cutting one of That's a thing, off. yeah. So um, what I realized is I could use the syndrome for a hi-hat. So I put the noise up. Oh, white noise, and then just filtering it. Right? That's right, and uh, it had a kill switch, and if you put your foot on the kill switch, it would just make a t -t 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 Perfect. Sound, and then lining up would open up that uh, gate for the white noise. And then I started doing things where we're using the, the oscillator in it as well, and some modulation. You went for like out there sounds as a percussive instrument almost immediately, right? That's right. Um, you know, with the analog uh, drums came computers, came uh, then sampling, drum machines, sequencing. Um, it was an amazing time for music and music technology because all these new tools then that we had as musicians and songwriters and bands had were driving the, the music. Mm -hmm. This is like also during the nascent days of MIDI. That's right. For me, you know, I became the guy in L.A., the go-to guy for electronic drums and, and all of that. I, when I first started, I made 20 flyers on my dot matrix printer. I sent it out to 20 studios, and within a week, I got a call to go down to Music Grinder and do work with uh, Greg Fillingaines for his mm -hmm. solo album. While I was in there, a, um, a um, gentleman, uh, Frank DeCaro, who would put together groups and studios and things like this for artists, um, like Melissa Manchester and things like that. Um, it happened to come in the studio to do a cassette dub from a commercial that his wife sung on. And he sees the Simmons kit in the other room, and he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa who, yeah, where did uh -huh. that come from? Oh, it's the kid over in the corner there. And he says, hey, you know, do you, you know you do this? I'm like, yeah. And, he said, well, the, I've got a session next Tuesday. Um, are you available? And that got me in on the uh, Pointer Sisters. When they brought me in there, the uh, studio engineers were trying to program the drum machine. And they could program a beat, but they couldn't program multiple beats and make it into a song. So every song had the same beat start to end. So I came in, reprogrammed the drum machine, and then brought in my electronics. And we triggered the Simmons brain, the clap trap, and maybe something else I had at the time. And uh, came up with the different drum sounds for the different songs. Uh -huh. um, and that just, you know, that was the kickstart of my career. 
the thing that I also think is interesting about all this is that you had not just the chops, but sort of a techno bent. I don't mean techno musically. I mean, technology wise, you were into a lot of the nuts and bolts of this stuff. Right. Yeah. I, um, I always found it fascinating. Um, mm -hmm. So I would go out of my way and learn how to do this and learn how to do this. And a lot of it, like I said earlier, was I had no, no, nothing to go off of. It's like, oh, these, these guys did this and those guys did that. It's right. like, I was one of those no rules. ones to do some of this stuff. And mm -hmm. we just made it up as we went along. And uh, we came up with some really interesting uh, uh, sounds and presets and uh, functionality. And that just, all, just blossomed into a variety of things. And I started doing work on, uh, I started doing drum triggers with drastic plastic. That was going to be the next question I asked was how you went from playing to creating tools. Right. Well, Simmons used to supply uh, these little contact mics and I would put them on uh, one of my drum pads uh, and trigger my clap trap from it. At some point, Simmons couldn't get them anymore. So I started calling around town, hey, do you guys have drum triggers? And so many stores said, no, we don't. We have other people asking for them, and if, uh, if you find some, please let us know. <laughs> so I started, I thought, well, it looks like I have to make them myself. Uh, I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't have an oscilloscope or anything, but I would had one of the early uh, Digi uh, sound tools systems. So I would plug my Paizo into there and hit it, and then open up that wave file and look at the waveform. So I found something that had a nice clean spike and as little extra vibration as possible and started making drum triggers originally for myself. Um, I was doing demos for Emu at the time and uh, the one and only time that Nam was in New Orleans, I was hired to go out there. We were showing the, the Emu e-drums and uh, they just come out with the SP-12. And, um, and I had my triggers and I asked, hey, can I show this stuff? And they said, yeah, sure. I put the triggers on into my pants. So uh, just, just like, if I'm sitting there and just tapping my legs. So I had a, a hi-hat on the right knee. I had a snare drum on the left one. I had tom-toms on the front of my knees. And I had a bass drum under my foot <laughs> on the right and a hi-hat under my foot on the left. And I would sit there in between demos and just kind of tap along and I got really good. And people would come up and so many people asked, are, are you making the music or are you just tapping along with the music? Um, oh, and then I had, I had one more trigger on a headband with a gong. So I would do nice. all this crazy stuff and then, <laughs> gong. And I got orders, I came back with an order for 200 triggers and it was like, okay. okay I guess I'm in business, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So how do you go from making music and making these tools to then also doing sound design, which was the next step, I think, in your career, right? That's right. So the... You know, as the technology evolved, like I said, analog since went to digital sense, went to digital sampling, drum machines, and computers, the uh, electronic drum, the, the big sensation uh, around that started to wean off a bit and, and work started to slow down. And so I wanted to do something. So I took the, the knowledge that I had and I said, well, I want to do sound design for movies. I want to do sound effects. I took a class at UCLA to learn what I didn't know. Mm -hmm. um, which is a lot of it was terminology. And I remember the first day at class, um, the teacher describing, they had one little digital audio workstation and they had it in the lobby to really showcase it because that was a really big deal. But everything else was still 24 individual one track tape machines mm -hmm. in the machine room. Really? Yeah. Not a, not a two inch machine? No. Because you wow. Had, because, you, because when you wanted to add a sound, Okay, we want uh, we need, need a door slam here. So they go into their little file drawers and look look in their uh, book. Okay, real 17B has door closers on really? it. They, so they didn't even use carts. They actually used reel-to-reel -reel tape. Reel-to-reel -reel tape. And they would, they would listen for, get the right one, record that off onto a little piece of tape, go to one of these 24 individual 24-track machines, or single 24 individual channel machines, and splice that piece of tape in there. Wow. That's time consuming, huh? And, the, and he was talking about that and he said, and then if we wanted to fade out, well, we would take a razor blade and scratch off some of the magnetic <laughs> particles on there or use acetone. And I did just what you did. I laughed and he looked at me and says, what's so funny? I said, you're kidding, right? And he goes, no. And I'm thinking, I'm going to rule this world. <laughs>
you went from music to sound design. Now, that's not just a different discipline, though. That's a different world it's a in terms of the people you're interfacing with, in terms of the way the job is done, the mentality of the tasks themselves. How'd you adapt to that? Well, I, um, I knew Frank Serafini through my relationship at Emu Systems. Frank was a big in Dorsey and um, was, he was really a great guy. big on the, uh, on the sound design and the composing scene at the time for movies. And um, I got a, Frank hired me at his studio. Well, he didn't, at the time, he needed a studio tech. He didn't need a sound designer. But he said, you know, if you start out doing this, we'll slowly get you into that. So I had to calibrate the 24 track machines and fix wiring on those gigantic multi-pin connectors and, mm -hmm. and all of that. And slowly they'd give me a little thing to do here and there and here and there. And we were doing everything with uh, emulator threes and MIDI. So we weren't laying anything. We would sequence it all, get everything where we wanted it, and then lay that to tape. Uh -huh. um, and the amazing thing about that, um, which Frank was a genius at, was instead of just taking an audio file and popping it in place, you had all the controls with, for the synthesizer. You have pitch band, you've got filters, you've got envelopes, you can do all kinds of things. Yes. Especially like if I'm, say I've got a jet sound, well, I'm trying to find something that fits the, the video. I can ride a filter and a pitch control in real time while I'm watching the video, get it right MIDI-wise, and then lay that and down. And then lay it down, yeah. Yeah, MIDI gave a lot of us who were not necessarily great players the ability to do parts that we couldn't do. That's right. You know, things like that. It really was, I, I mean, I think digital recording was a game changer. MIDI definitely was a game changer. Yeah. I think all of these things converging, all of these different technologies and standards converging at the same time really changed the whole art of production. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So I pretty much became a, an audio technologist. And there was a company called Lone Wolf they were in Redondo Beach, and um, they gave me an endorsement. They got funding from Paul Allen, who was Bill Gates' partner in Microsoft. Paul had a little bit of money to throw around, and um, I was the uh, first new hire that they brought in. Um, and I was their audio, digital audio guy. So Worked all there. of a sudden you were a corporate guy. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, you know, and I knew Mark Lakus, the uh, president of the company, Super nice guy. We would we live really close to each other. We'd have jam sessions and things. And he went took me out to lunch to offer me the job. Well, I didn't want the job. I was doing post production. Uh, Elmo Weber, who also worked at Frank Serafini's, he and I left and started our own company. And we did a few movies together. And so Mark takes me out to lunch. And so I thought, well, I'll just say, well, I need this salary and I need this much stock options, and I'll make it realistic but out of range. So you know, we shake right. hands and we're still friends. So I gave him the number, and he said, well, okay. And it was like, <laughs> and I had, a, I had a, a new baby and a you know, family, and it was like, oh, steady paycheck, sounds okay. Mm -hmm. The company's right down the street. And after a year, they decided to move to Seattle and offered me the chance to move with them, and I ended up doing that. And just a year and a half after we moved to Seattle, the company went belly up. Oops. Yeah. Now I was in Seattle. Hmm. Huh. Well, yeah, Seattle had a good music scene. Yeah, Seattle was really cool. And we have, it was, you know, step down as far as, you know, craziness of L.A. Still big enough city where things going on. A lot of technology, a lot of art, a lot of music. I yeah. thought it was pretty great. I got a gig at Microsoft doing sound design work there. Uh, Microsoft started, started a bunch of these little online shows, and one of them was Riff. And uh, my friend Andrea Weatherhead was the director of that, and I'd worked. Uh, on some other projects in Microsoft with her. And uh, we were the first ones to publicly use sound fonts. After about three and a half years, the digital backlot at Microsoft, where I worked, um, closed down. And I was doing freelance work. Andrea was a consultant at the Experience Music Project, which hadn't even broke ground yet. And she was working on another project. They asked her to run the interactive development team. Uh -huh. Um, she called me up because she knew I knew a lot about MIDI tech, um, music and MIDI and music instrument technology. Hey, we want to make these hands-on musical instrument interactives. Um, I met with her. We talked about it. So I made a couple of the first prototypes that Paul Allen uh, played with. And everybody liked them, and they offered me a full-time job. Well, suddenly I'm in the museum business. And it, it was funny. I 
I meet friends that, you know, of course, we're all bouncing around different companies and stuff. And they're, oh, so what are you doing now? I'm like, well, I'm working at this, mu this museum. And you could just see the thought bubble of like, right. you know, Wait, stuff, what? Peller, stuff polar bear <laughs> and, you know, Indians in a canoe yeah, crossing sure. the river. And, um, sure. And so I described what I did. More of a science museum in yeah. a sense, yeah. right? Yeah, well, big, uh, you know, of course, Paul Allen, heavy technology. Exactly, yeah. Use. Um, and we designed a successful gallery. Um, we even, <laughs> we submitted them to the American Association of Museums, uh, five of our exhibits for um, consideration for this Muse Award that they do. And uh, they called up Andrea uh, a few weeks later and they said, well, we have a problem with your submissions. She said, oh, what is that? She, they said, well, currently you guys are first, second, and third place. And we'd like to- uh, That's not a good look. We'd like to share, <laughs> we'd like to share the awards with other people. And we like everything that you've given us. Can we give you an award for the entire gallery? And we, of course, we said, sure. And, uh, and we did. So um, nice feather in our hat for mm -hmm. both of us and our team. When did you start getting into immersive stuff? At Experience Music Project. So Paul Allen came to our team and they said, I want you guys to build an experience that, is, that simulates playing live on stage at a concert. That was all the direction we had. Mm -hmm. A lot of us on the team were musicians. We'd get together and say, so what is it for you? What, what do you think about? What do you think about? Mm -hmm. And of course, well, it's the, you know, the sound, the crowd, and it's the, you know, everybody looking back at you and, and you know, the stage and the lights and the amplifiers. So we made this cool room, this amazing immersive experience called On Stage. We went, uh, I'm, you know, as I mentioned, good friends with the guys in Yes. They let us come down to what was the Universal Amphitheater and record the crowd sounds um, with eight channels. So we had six mics in front of the stage. We had two mics behind the stage. So we got, captured all the crowd murmuring before the show and the big cheers, uh, you know, when the curtains open and, um, and uh, at the end of songs and things like that. I brought those eight channels back in. I custom designed the sound system for the ambience and everything else and I programmed the entire thing on Opcode Studio Vision. Let's fast forward to present day, because you've been doing a lot of other stuff since then, and these days, your work is still kind of all over the map, isn't it? It is, uh, and, and I enjoy that. I like, the job keeps interesting because I have to learn something. Mm -hmm. I have to figure out how to do something that nobody else has done. Um, I got a job at Disney. I was hired for uh, Imagineering. I was hired for five weeks and lasted three and a half years. So where do you get your inspiration from? Just, I've got this weird brain, and I, <laughs> <laughs> I can't yeah. help myself. <laughs> I just, I just, you know, I just kind of brainstorm things, and I like to. I, I don't usually come off with these ideas right off the bat. I kind of, I like to sit on them and think about them for a while. And usually in the shower is mm -hmm. my magic moment. I'll be scrubbing up and like, oh, I wonder if I could pull this off. Is it typically in response to? I don't want to say a problem, but a request, a challenge, anything like that? Or is it just something where you go, I think I'm going to make a left-handed Framistat. Somebody will want it. <laughs> it's a little bit of both. Uh -huh. um, a lot of it's driven by, by the requests and, and the needs for specific projects. And some of it is just things that, that I do on my own. It's like, you know, I'll be back here. I mean, I mean this is my Nintendo. I don't yeah, play. I've course. got a PlayStation and, uh, and the Nintendo in the uh, living room that, haven't been touched in oh this is way more fun in years but yeah. um you know the modular synthesizer and all of this stuff my electronic drums and, mm -hmm. um i just come back here and and play around and you know what if mm -hmm. a lot of what ifs it's been a lot of fun i've had a, a great career and have done a lot of things that i'm very proud of um one, one of the the things i'm most proud of is uh in washington state i was part of a nonprofit organization called music uh, Music Aid Northwest, and we would put on these concerts, uh, get artists to donate their time, get a deal, or get a free venue. We would create some money, we donate it to causes for music education, and then we'd start all over again, start from scratch, figure out what we're going to do, how we're going to do it, who's going to participate. We did this three or four times. Um, I was the vice president on the board, and um, I'm driving down the street, and I pull up behind a car, and they had this beautiful license plate. And I'm like, wow, what is that? And it's Washington State Parks. And a little dingy light, <laughs> light bulb went off in my head. I'm like, 
I wonder if we could do this for music education. I uh, went mm. back to uh, the next board meeting and said, I've got this idea. It's kind of crickets in the room. Uh, the president, uh, they weren't against it, but it, it was total left field. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, get some information on it and, and let us know. Um, we had to get two laws passed. Uh, one to get the state to make new license, custom uh, license plates again. And uh, the second to allow ours to be uh, accepted in that. Fast forward to today, uh, they've donated probably at over, you know, close to $2 million to fund music education in Washington State schools. Nice. Uh, there's a similar project now that somebody just turned me on to in California, and I'm trying to find those people because I think, first of all, I think NAM should get behind it. Absolutely. And be part of it. And I think we should not only do it in California, but everybody should do that in every state. Well, and NAM has been very much behind education. I have to applaud them for that. So yes. I think the idea of getting them involved in this would be a conversation definitely to be had. Yeah. The cool thing about the license plate is it's self-perpetuating. So sure. um, if you buy the license plate, 80-something percent of the people renew it every year. So there's another $17 from every person that goes back into the, into the pool. So... Um, Let's wrap with just a question I ask a lot of people, and in your case would be definitely an interesting one. Uh, what advice would you give to a young person coming up in today's crazy technology world? Well, there's, there's so much to offer and so many things. Um, one thing I see people do that causes problems is they'll go out and they'll buy a bunch of gear all at once. And then you're just overwhelmed because I don't know how to use this, I don't know how to use that, I don't know how to do that. So every time you turn to do something, there's an obstacle in your way. You know, get, get one thing or two things at a time and master those and, and then add to that. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm guilty of that uh, to an extent because I have so many things now that uh, back in the day when we were starving musicians, we had a few things. And we got squeezed every little ounce Absolutely. Of, of love out of that thing. Absolutely. You had one synthesizer, but man, you got every sound possible out of it. You're yeah. right. Yeah. Um, and nowadays, I've got an iPad mount uh, above my modular synthesizer. So if I need to pull up a manual, uh, which, mm -hmm. which I do occasionally, I mean, some of these, some of them are straightforward and some of them have uh, secondary functions, third functions, uh, deep diving menus, um, things like that. But it's also fun just to, you know, throw caution to the wind and I'll take this cable and plug it in what if? there. Oh, no, not there. Ooh, there. What if? That's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, to your point, I think there is a, there's a benefit from the limitations because when you have too many, it's the same thing like when you have too many tracks. Yes. You know, you end up just trying another take or another this or another that and you end up with the, the proverbial paralysis of analysis. You've tried so many different things, and I think the idea of saying, well, I just want to accomplish this thing. How do I do it? And really, you know, it's like when you study art and they limit you to one particular piece of media that you can only use, you know? I think those restrictions are actually, they're freeing in a way. Yeah, yeah, you're right. If, 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 if you don't have the distraction of, too many options, um, I, I think it hel helps you focus a bit. I think so too, um, yeah. And, uh, and you know, you'll be amazed, but you don't need this stuff. Um, I like this stuff and I can afford this stuff and so I have this stuff. And a lot of, a lot of like my modular stuff, uh, when I got into this seven years ago, I've been a synthesizer programmer for decades. Um, Emu Systems, uh, Dynacord, uh, Simmons, um, I've got sounds and presets and all kinds of different devices and software instruments. And um, when I got into this, uh, it was through uh, Waldorf. And I got the Waldorf uh, KV-37 with their modules. And it took me about 20 minutes to get, it, to get it to make a sound. And it took me another about 15 or 20 minutes to get that sound to stop. <laughs> <laughs> that was a big, uh, big awakening of understanding what I don't know about modular synthesizers and patching sure. things together. And I've learned a ton now about it, and it's turned into another thing that I can do to, to, uh, 
to make money and get my name out there. Um, and I just really enjoy it. And now I've got it fully integrated in with uh, Nuendo, which is my DAW. And I've got sends and returns going both ways. So I can use a great uh, universal audio plugin uh, in the computer as an effect send from as an the, effect from the, the Eurorack uh -huh. and then back in here and continue to screw up the sound with some other modules and vice versa. I, I mm -hmm. use the Eurorack a lot for a special process that I don't have in the multitude of plugins I have. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's just something about hands-on yes. that I really like. Yes, I um, agree. Just tweaking stuff and yeah. playing around with it. And I think that's, that's another thing. Uh, I think the tactile experience, you know, because so many people learned everything on the computer and not to disparage that at all. But I think when you learn on the computer, you don't necessarily learn a lot of the basic principles, signal flow, gain structure, all of that stuff that I think really changes the way you approach making music with these instruments. Yeah, no, you're, you're right. There's some newer things like uh, Cherry Audio, mm -hmm. um, who have uh, their great um, um, voltage modular, oh, the voltage modular yeah. program, mm -hmm. which is a modular synthesizer thing. And that's a great tool for people who want to get into modular synthesizer. Yes. It's a great tool to learn from. Mm -hmm. And what's nice is you've got presets you can recall. With this, I get it, you know, I was, when I first started with the modular synthesizer, I get a great sound. And I didn't want to unplug it. But, right. I'll never get this but again. That was it. You know, I've got one sound and uh, what do I do? You know, so it's like, okay, you got to just unplug it and start from scratch all over again. And, and, and also keep your eyes open because when I started, I want to be a studio drummer. That was, that was my course. Of course, you know, I did a big left turn when I ran into electronic drums and that kick started a different kind of career. But I'm still in the music business, I'm still in the sound business. And, and I absolutely love what I do. And I think that's key right there is, I think for all of us, we think we know what we're gonna do. All of a sudden we discover all these other things and you end up doing something completely different. Yeah, you know, I just, I, I keep an eye open for, you know, an opportunity, an open door here and I could do that. And I love the idea, you just said it, of just being adventurous, man, just jump. Yeah. You know, because really it's like, what have you got to lose? Yeah, exactly. Like you said, you could at least try it, you know, and even though you may fail, as long as you learn something along the way, you've gained, you know, and it's like, okay, well that, and that gives you an idea for the next leap that you want to take. But it all comes down to just being open to new experiences. That's right. Keep your eyes open and your ears open and, uh, and then keep smiling. Yeah. <laughs> Good advice. Rick Havoc, thank you for being my guest. My pleasure. Hey, I'm Daniel Keller. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and join us each week for Insights and Sound.